Hello and welcome to Our Experts Podcast. I am Carol Matichka, your host, bringing you fascinating perspectives from the world and realm of pharmacy. All right. Well, I am so happy and have the pleasure today to introduce you all to Dr. Kathy Baldwin. Uh, just a wonderful person and a great friend of mine, actually, who's a critical care pharmacist, but also past president for the FSHP um, organization. So thank you and welcome, Dr. Baldwin. Thank you, Dr. Matishka. I'm honored to be your friend. Uh, oh, um, it, you're such a, a, a fabulous um, role model, and I can't talk highly enough about you. Um, and so today I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about what you do for our profession, because I want people to understand what an impact you have made and truly how much of your life you have dedicated to advocacy. So can you first just share with our audience how you became um, a pharmacist, what got you interested, and, and really where your passion started. Absolutely. So I'm probably one, I'm probably in that percentile, the odd percentile, hopefully the 99 and not the one. Who <laughs> knew I wanted to be a pharmacist when I was in high school? Oh, wow. My father was a physician. And every time we tried to go on vacation, he something came up. And I remember saying to myself, I will never be a physician and I will never marry a physician. And I used to go into his office and work in there. He was my best friend and um, organize his medications at a very young age. So I never had any doubt in my mind that I was not going to be a pharmacist. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. So, um, uh, somewhere along the journey of being a pharmacist, I think the advocacy bug must have really hit you. Uh, so what was it that really sparked that interest? I think it was probably multifaceted. The first, uh, my awareness was when I became FSHP president-elect, which was in 2015, and I had a mentor. Uh, Deborah Brown, and she told me, you know, Kathy, you need to lead this this society, and you need to be really engaged in what's going on legislatively. So I listened to that, and I went up to Tallahassee in 2015, and I couldn't believe my eyes and my ears because the physicians at that time were disrespecting the pharmacists. And the legislators were kind of laughing at us. And we went up there to tell them, hey, you know, we're here to talk to you about collaborative practice agreements. And there, people were going up there saying pharmacists are dangerous. Don't listen to these pharmacists. I, there was a plastic surgeon from Miami, and he said, don't let these pharmacists inject Botox into your face. And I had, I had finished a, a PGY, well, actually now it's a PGY too, but I had finished an Amcare residency at the VA. So I knew what we were trying to accomplish. And I, from having done that residency, I remember working in an amiodarone clinic and seeing amiodarone patients, you know, maybe for eight hours, one day a week. And I would get all their labs and have them come in. I'd call them the night before. I'd say, I'm going to see you for your appointment. Your EKG is set up. Your um, blood tests will be done. We'll get your PFTs done. Please bring in your eye exam. And, and I was really engaged in that role and, and other roles in my residency. And, um, and so then I would sit down with a cardiologist after seeing all those patients. And it would take 10 minutes of his time to be able to say yay or nay to continuing the drug because mostly pulmonary function toxicities. So what I was bringing to the table was very high level. And then to be kind of ridiculed that I want to inject Botox into people's faces, really, it was like a slap in the face to me. And I didn't react well to that. And I thought, who are these jokers? And why do they not understand what pharmacists do? And I think it was that day that I got bit by the advocacy bug. And 
I've not been able to stop since. So today was my day off and I'm reading health policy on the Kaiser Family Foundation. (laughs) (laughs) Because you you do not stop. (laughs) I I can't get enough of it. Honestly, I was thinking about retiring and becoming a lawyer. (sighs) You you (laughs) might be able to do that at this point in time. And no, so, I'm just kidding. Though. Yeah, no, no it's, it's great. So you bring up an interesting point in when we talk about advocacy and and dealing with other professions. And, and um, I think it's a challenge when we see like certain glimpses of what some individuals might be saying. And we know, you and I know that that's certainly not most most um, physicians, but you know, that can really stand out and it can be a challenge. But then at the same time, it also encouraged you to really move forward with that advocacy bug and even do more so that you can make sure people understand who we are and what we do. So, um, well, there's such a disconnect between who we are and what we do and what the public and what the legislators and even what other healthcare providers perceive versus reality. That yeah. it's a huge knowledge gap. Yeah, and and I kind of blame us in, to some degree. I think we need to do a better job of really talking to people about what we're capable of and what we're able to do for the healthcare system and for patients. So um, I really encourage people who are listening to really go out there. If you're a pharmacist or work in pharmacy, make sure people understand how important we are and what we're doing. So I can't emphasize that enough for sure. Um, Agreed. So so we talk a lot, I think, on this show about the FPA, but maybe tell us a little bit about the FSHP. You obviously have a lot of knowledge with all of your background with FSHP. So FSHP stands for Society of Health System Pharmacists, Mm -hmm. and it's kind of a misnomer in the name because it implies hospital, but it's more than hospital. Uh, A lot of ambulatory care clinics are associated with health systems. And so a lot of the legislation that's coming forward really impacts us in ways that we didn't realize. So um, we're open to everyone. I I kind of think of us as a a niche group. If you work in a hospital or you work in a clinic, then we have something for you. And it doesn't mean that we won't accept everyone. We certainly will. And um, but but we want people to engage to to where they can serve the best. And so we're never in competition with FPA. We always work collaboratively and we strive to to make that our goal. So you can call us the other society if you want to. We're good with that. (laughs) Um, But, you know, some of the offerings that we have within FSHP are uh, fit my need as a critical care pharmacist because we have monthly critical care slash ED focus groups and we meet once a month and then we have 340B focus groups and we have um, medication safety officer focus groups and that that type of thing. Yeah. So lots of variety, I would say, in FSHP as we, we find an FPA. It, but in the end, what I always tell people, join a state organization. It's so important for our profession and really um, making sure that we have the voice and we're the ones who are actually going forward and talking um, to the to the public and the legislators, but um, really to the heart of health care so that there's an understanding of what we're doing. So um, just being a member can be enough. We'd love, of course, people to be more involved, but just being a member uh, really can go a very long way. And I tell people that all the time. Um, so is there anything in particular FSHP? And, and by the way, um, Dr. Bill Turnius was on with us last week, so he was able to provide some of this information too. Uh, but I love hearing from you and your thoughts on um, what upcoming events FSHP uh, has that you might be excited about or may want to share with people. Absolutely. So as part of ASHP, the mid-year clinical meeting is coming up in December. And um, in January, I am going on a cruise and we call it CE at Sea. 
So I'll be flying to Miami and getting on a cruise ship down there and presenting. Fine. And in the springtime, we have the residency showcase. And those are, and then of course our annual meeting in August. Sure. Yeah. And he he talked a bit about that as well. Um, so talk to me about the CE at C. Is that just open to any pharmacist? Yes. Um, I think you have to be a member and okay. it's to cause people to join. Um, and then I've been doing it so long that I, I have to break it down here. So you would become a member and then you would sign up for the CESC. You go through our travel agent and you get discounts and stuff like that. And then um, we get, I think, six hours of CE during a four night cruise, but we oh, all hang good. out together. So we have our meals together. Yeah. We, we have our away time from each other and then we get back together, but we do it once a year and it's so much fun. Oh, that's great. Can people bring spouses and family? And oh family? yes. Okay, great. They, a whole families come. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. That's, that's a fun event. So um, what are some of the priorities nationally that pharmacists are really facing right now legislatively? So I, I think the biggest one by far is um, provider status. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about national issues, we can use that term provider status. And we have HR 1770. I have I never remember the name, so I keep my slides handy. And that is the Equitable Community Access to Pharmacist Services Act. This bill has a real chance of passing the uh, Congress is going to need to meet in December because the government shuts down on December 20th. So there may be a last minute push to get a package through. And we've been contacting, we're in the middle of a grassroots outreach, contacting our congressmen and asking them to please support H.R. 1770. And this would be monumental because it would allow pharmacists to be healthcare care providers for Medicare Part B. So that means that we could provide care and actually bill for the care as opposed to being attached to a drug right. and bill for that service of dispensing. So, so what, it would be a foot in the door. Yeah. What can our listeners do to support that bill? So I can send you information and they can that would contact their congressman. Yeah, I can put that and, in the show notes for everybody as well. That'd be great. Perfect. Okay. So um, we have reached out to uh, Rutherford up here, and we have reached out to Aaron Bean, Congressman, and we're just kind of chipping away at the whole entire state. So if we can get people by their voting zip code and they're interested in talking to a congressman, we'll actually go on the call with them. And uh, and kind of help, you know, facilitate that discussion or we can have a train the trainer or whatever oh, they want to do. Yeah, yeah however great. they want to engage, we're willing to to do that because we, we really need to um, enhance engagement in sure. advocacy. Absolutely. And then if, if I were to ask you what you think our number one priority in the state of Florida is, what would you say that is? Well, I finally can put it into two words. Okay. Payment parity bill. Okay. So that's my new term. I think I might've stolen it from Joy Wright and Dan Buffington. I'm not quite sure, but the bottom line is pharmacists should be reimbursed like nurse practitioners and PAs mm -hmm. for our services. And, um, and we should, it's a called a payment parity bill because we would be able to bill for our services without, you know, dispensing a drug product, just as nurse practitioners and PAs. Our scope would be a little bit different. We don't perform a differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of medication monitoring, medication altering, and it would all be done via collaborative practice agreements, which we already have. So it's not an expanded scope. It's simply payment for those services. So, Let's say, um, Kathy, what would you say to somebody who says, okay, you all are looking for payment for services. How is that going to help in regards to saving us money, the healthcare system, or, or how will that affect the healthcare system and costs? Well, so for healthcare, for the studies have shown for every $1 spent, 
$10 are saved when you involve a, a pharmacist in the discussion. So when I talk to my legislators, I talk about that. Mm -hmm. And I say, if you look at the cost savings from my intervening in a patient. So I use a patient I just had recently. She'd been coming to the hospital every 30 days being intubated. Uh, because of COPD exacerbations, and she was on a medication for pulmonary artery hypertension, and she had not been had a had a left heart cath, so she had not been appropriately cla uh, cas classified. There's five subtypes, and if you treat the subtype one the way you would treat subtype five, then it doesn't work. And so she was on a medication that was causing her to come into our hospital. So my physician in the critical care pulmonology group identified that. And so we were, I was able to think unlike any other member of that team. And I went right into her allergies and I put in there, this patient should not receive sildenafil. She has not had a left heart cath. It is causing her 30 day hospitalizations in the ICU every month. Please do not restart this until she has a left heart cath. Then I called the outpatient physician and he said, well, it's, it's your, your doctor's prescribing it a discharge. I said, it's okay, whatever it is, let's just stop it. Yeah. Do you know she hasn't come back for an inpatient visit in six months? Oh, wow. So it's just a different thinking process that we right. bring. And then I had a patient who came in, he was a Medicare patient. He had been prescribed methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. He had gotten two weeks worth of medicine. It's one day a week, five tablets, six tablets, once a week. And he had fulminant liver failure. Hmm. Now, had he been genetically tested, a pharmacist would have said, don't prescribe this medication until we know that he can metabolize this drug. Interestingly, my mother took methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. And she almost died. And oh, I got wow. 23andMe and I got some other DNA testing done. And it said, never take methotrexate. You will die. Wow. So had we had that extra set of eyes on there, he was going to go on the transplant list. Now imagine oh, wow. the cost associated with a liver transplant that could have been prevented by a pharmacist having eyes on that patient and saying, hey, before we prescribe this, we need to check them to see if they have, you know, if they can metabolize it or not. Yeah. So that kind of shows you $1 spent, $10 saved. It's all about prevention. Absolutely. And and the problem we're having is by not being re reimbursed properly for the care that we're providing, we're not able to hire enough pharmacists. And the pharmacists are often um, associated mostly with the product as opposed to all of our clinical services that we can provide. And so because of that, it's very challenging. We can't necessarily provide all the full care that we can provide to our patients um, when it's some of those day-to-day -day challenges that we're also dealing with. So uh, that's that's one of the things that I like to talk about. Do you, do you feel the same way? A hundred percent. And yeah. um, so last year, Walgreens brought a bill forward and they want to uh, take the pharmacist out of the dispensing process so that we can be freed up to do other things. Right. And, you know, I said to them, well, why don't you, and they want to put a technician in that process. Why don't you use automated dispensing cabinets where you have a pharmacist looking over remotely um, to make sure that the dispensing process is okay right. and help us get legislation to get reimbursement or a, a payer Parity bill would be now the new term. Right. And, um, you know, it, it, so I'm concerned about the dispensing. We can't rely on that aspect of it anymore. We've got to get legislation that allows us to be treated like other health care providers. Sure. But, but at the same token, I had an interesting um, question from a student. Actually, last night we were talking about advocacy. And he said, you know, pharmacists... <laughs> are the most accessible healthcare providers. And we are the most accessible because we're in those community pharmacies that are located on every corner. And that is such an important piece of it. So I said to him, yes, I understand we have automation and, and you know, of course, they're looking to place more technicians as opposed to pharmacists in a lot of these locations, which would be very detrimental because on top of um, 
you know, all that's done in regards to the product, it's really us being there and having that face to face and those connections and communication and our accessibility that saves the healthcare system so much money when you can walk into a community pharmacy and talk to somebody as opposed to walking into the emergency department. And I'm not saying that'll always be the case because you might see them and say you do need to go to the emergency department um, at that point, but at least they have that ability to do that. And so paying us though for our services that we're doing even in the community pharmacy is, is so important so we can continue to be there and be a part of the healthcare team as well. So just point Yeah, out. my first job was in community mm -hmm. and I worked for CVS and I remember patients coming in and having chest pain and I was sure. able to assist them and triage them. I remember a patient having a seizure and I was able to protect his head, lay him on his side, you know, stay, keep people away. So, I mean, there, there's so many things that we do that people just don't know. Right. And, and and those are things, unfortunately, that technicians just haven't been trained for. And so having that pharmacist there who's able to triage and provide, um, you know, some type of immediate care that... That family member who's scared their their child, for instance, has a high fever and they're not sure what to do. Um, just all these questions that we get, tons of questions every day. So important. I remember triaging a lady with a screaming baby and there were 15 people at my counter. And I said to the entire group, does anyone mind if I fill this baby's prescription ahead of everybody else's <laughs> so she can get out of this store and not one person mind it? Yes, poor child. Uh, I think that's some one of the things we always have to remember. People are are angry or upset oftentimes, but it's not at us. It's because of whatever they're dealing with. And that baby was obviously dealing with a lot. <laughs> exactly. She needed that antibiotic stat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I had a lot of other questions. What What are your thoughts on AI? Is is that something that you've thought a lot about in regards to AI and pharmacy? So I try to go to as many CEs on AI as I can. I went to a I went to a CE recently, and they told us about generational differences. I'm a baby boomer, and they said, you know, baby boomers are much more tech savvy than people know. Oh, sure. So I'm using Chat GPT, and I'm showing my students, but I'm cautioning them because I'm like, look, you know, if you put the question in in a certain way, it'll tell you what you want to hear. Right. What you've got to do is ask for it, where is the reference for this statement? Right. And then I, I use it, it. It cuts my time down to nothing to find literature that I'm looking to share with my physicians. Um, but honestly, as far as the technology goes, I'm kind of removed from that, except for maybe the cardiovascular technologies, you know, the Watchmans and the yeah. and, and, and that kind of technology that we see. Yeah, I, I do think it's going to be a big game changer exciting. in healthcare. Very exciting. Absolutely. Um, and we have to embrace it. We just have to know its limitations, but embrace it as well. So I um, have to laugh. We we got a new computer system. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. And it's called Epic. If you let it, it will think for you. So I am very cautious about that. And sometimes I just laugh out loud because I'm like, oh, you stupid Epic. You will never replace me. <laughs> yes, you were right if this was true, but A, B, and C are, are, are not true. D, E, and F are, and therefore you are wrong. Delete. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Sums it up right there. Um, so just letting people know, what can they do to push our profession forward? What, in, in Kathy Baldwin's words, what can pharmacists out there and, and friends of pharmacists do? So I think having relationships with legislators, being engaged and letting them know that you're their constituent. And I, I never talk to somebody until um, I have a constituent with me. And when I do talk to my, my congressmen and my legislators in Florida or senators, I will say, I am your voting constituent mm -hmm. because I want them to know and I'm actually a super voter, which means I vote in, in the, the smallest of the elections. I'm out there voting. Um, and I think that is super crucial because that causes them to say, oh, this is someone who knows 
you know, who's engaged. They they're watching and they they want to say something and we need to listen to them. Right. And then you you speak to them like they put their pants on the same way you put your pants on. And as you speak to them, you don't talk to them as a, a farm D to a physician. You speak to them as a person to another person. So mm-hmm. developing those relationships with the legislators and the physicians. So at work, I'm constantly telling my physicians, hey, it is not what you think it is. It is about physician-led team-based care. You're the boss. We can make you shine. So support us. And so um, I've been able to make some inroads within Baptist because my physicians are part of the Duval County Medical Association. And um, and now they contact me when they have a question about a bill. That's great. So they're like, let's ask Kathy. So, you know, I, I'll tell them, oh, yeah, well, it might look like this, but here's what's going on. Yeah. And then they always walk away satisfied. I always say to them, did I answer your question? Tell me if you have any more. Tell me if I missed it. So um, those it's about relationships. It really is. I think that's such a huge part of it. And and people can start at the local level. You don't need to go to Tallahassee. It's actually better to actually engage at the local level, that they know you're their constituent, just like you said. So important. And then they can count on you when they've got questions and just need those answers because you're the yeah. one who knows. Um, you've got the expertise. And one thing I, I tell our students all the time, too, is, you know, you voted for them. I mean, they essentially work for you. They want to know what what needs to be done. They want to know how to vote. And so um, they they want that information from you as, as these bills come up and which way that they should, um, you know, uh, push for. So... Uh, just get out there and do it, I think, is the bottom line. You'll be happy you did. It, it really is a bug, too. I will tell you, once once you get into it, it's very catchy. So, it's a good bug. It is a good bug. It's not um, a GI bug. No. So um, are you having difficulty with shortages? I know that that's an, an issue that's come up all over, and especially with the IV fluids. Um and I've had patients, I've had students ask about that. And, um, you know, uh, Bill did a great job last week of, of talking about that and addressing that. But is there anything you wanted to share uh, with our audience in that regards? Well, during our grassroots outreach this year, we told the congressman that we don't have legislation right now addressing drug shortages, but it's coming in 2025. Oh, good. So we kind of are so reactive, like a third world country. You know, when we saw this, when Hurricane Maria took Puerto Rico out, and now we have it with Hurricane Helene taking Baxter yeah. out in North uh, Carolina. Right. And the shortages are really impacting patient care. Some hospitals yeah. are trans- are canceling elective um, surgeries, which is never good for anybody. Um, yeah. The other thing is that the vancomycins, I could pull my hair out oh, with the different ways that we've tried to, yeah, because you cannot, we've got to push dose antibiotics, which is okay for most antibiotics, but you can't do that for vancomycin. Yeah. I have my doctors trying to order normal saline because they think I, they can't have LR, but they're critical care, so they can have LR. It is just confusion. Yeah. And it's, well, you don't know what you're going to have on a day to day basis is the biggest source of the confusion. Yeah, that's really, really challenging. Um, So I I like that there's this potential for a bill to address some of the shortages that have been ongoing. We don't want it to affect patient care. People have been very creative in regards to dealing with the shortages. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, So let me change gears a little bit and talk about PBMs because you and I worked a lot on the PBM bill for Florida. Um, So where do we stand with all of that now? I know there are still challenges. Uh, It it wasn't something that just fixed everything, that's for sure. No, but I do want to say one thing with you and I. It was so lovely that that bill passed during our tenure as presidents, that I share that bond with you. 
And, uh, and that makes me so happy. That was great. So the PBMs, and, and this is nationally, it, and of course, I have to use the term alleged, mm-hmm. the PBMs allegedly find, it's like the, the book or the process called whack-a-mole, you know, you use the word rebate, and then they take out the word rebate, and they call it something else. You say you can't steer to their pharmacies, and then they call it, well, it's not a pharmacy, it's another term. Right. I mean, it, it's constantly a recreation of um, things to get around the law. So right now, um, we're working with FPA, and we have the FPA community and independent pharmacy issues, and we just did a survey and we're finding that the way they're reading the legislation and the way that we're reading the legislation, um, they're saying no oral chemotherapy drugs are covered under allegedly under 1550 and that they have sole access to dispensing of those drugs. But um, they're, they're working on one thing, one line that says including injectables, inhalers, um, and it doesn't include orals. But so our so we're going after that. So the OIR, everything has to be reported to the Office of Insurance Regulators. Mm-hmm. And what has happened in the past is that they always side with the PBM. So you have to go to the PBM first. They yeah. reject the patient and the claim. Then you send it to OIR. Then OIR says, well, what's the PBM's response? And then the, oh, the PBM says, we rejected it for this reason. And then OIR supports their rejection. So we're working um, with the legislators, and I think Shane will be instrumental here, how important it is to have a pharmacist legislator in office yeah, no um, to get this ironed out um, because the way we read the language and the way they're interpreting the same language, uh, they're opposites. Sure. So that's, and then, then they're using something called plan design as a term. Oh, we, we can't let you in here because of the plan design. Wow. We can't let you fill this prescription because of the plan design. Well, I have, I have a, um, a contract with you. No, nope, it's the plan design. It, it exempts you. Wow. So those are the two big buckets that we just found last week, actually. So it's an ongoing Not surprising. Process. No, it's yes. not surprising. But that's why we need us and we need our organizations um, to really be there and be that voice. So important. So important. For the patients. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. We have to help the patients. Um, so in your mind, if somebody comes to me and says, I'd like to switch from community pharmacy to hospital pharmacy, and you've been a hospital pharmacist for quite some time, what would you recommend or what do you recommend to those individuals? So um, this is kind of interesting, but back in, I came to Baptist in Jacksonville back in 2006 and the director had one question for me before he would interview me. And this was told to me through the recruiter. The recruiter said, do you have a residency? And I said, yes. And he said, okay, we, they will interview you. They will not interview anyone without a residency. So now that was back in 2006. Then I think with the pandemic, we started to see a paradigm shift a little bit. And um, pharmacists were able to make that jump from community into hospital without having a residency. My recommendation would be to get a board certification. Mm -hmm. I have a board certification and... um, this is kind of interesting. I have a lot of cancer patients in my ICU and I found that I have a knowledge deficit in chemotherapy. So every time I have a patient come in and they, they take chemo and they're neutropenic fever or they're having liver dysfunction or pulmonary from the immunotherapies, I have to stop what I'm doing and I have to delve into the literature and and get educated. So I just recently did some BPS credits on chemotherapy. And I told my boss, I said, this has nothing to do with ICU, but it has everything to do with my ICU patients. So I I need to get updated on this. And I I think board certification provides a pathway. Yeah. That and experience. They say one residency is equivalent, or at least you can correct me on this. One residency is worth five years of experience. And then you bring that board certification in there. And I think that that's the boost that sure. could push you over the threshold. They're doing non-traditional residencies uh, down in South Florida, 
where you work one month as a pharmacist and one month as a resident. And you do that oh, for two years. Isn't oh. that awesome? I mean, yeah. that's even helps staff pharmacists who want to kind of upgrade their knowledge base. Sure. Um, yeah. It, and it's, it's a viable pathway for many people. Expand their opportunities. I didn't do a traditional. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say expand their opportunities, whatever it might be. Yeah. I didn't do a traditional residency. I worked for 15 years mm -hmm. and I, then I went from a BS degree to a farm D degree in 1999 with Sven Norman and yep. your group. That's right. And I got the working farm D degree. And then my mentor said to me, Kathy, congratulations, you're equivalent to all the other pharmacists, go do a residency. And so she said, go to the VA and do a residency. And, and so I did, I took a year off and I yeah. went and I did a residency. I have never regretted that decision ever. It was like the second best decision of my entire life. Yeah, it, second best. Oh, I like that. It, it, it can be tough, sure, but... Um, did you moonlight during that time to try to make no a, way? No. Oh, wow. No, a a, this is a funny story. I went from a $90,000 salary at the time because it was the year 2000 uh -huh. to a 29,900 oh, for one wow. year. Yeah. Do you know, I saved more money that year than I ever did because I had no time to do anything except <laughs> eat, sleep and work. And when I was done, I had all this money. And I'm like, where did this come from? And they're like, well, you're not shopping. You're not partying. Yeah. You're not going on a cruise. You're... No vacations. No anything. <laughs> there you go. So you can actually save so, money going to do a residency. But I think it's easier if you go from a student to a sure. residency because you're not used to a paycheck. But you can but do it. I just it. thought that was funny. You can do it. So either way. Well, if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, Kathy, it's been so fun having you on here. Is there anything else you wanted to share with our audience before we go? Um, I just want to thank them for listening to this podcast. It's so important for your future to engage in the advocacy process. And we don't expect you to be advocacy whizzes though some of you may be sure all we're asking is to partner with us and we'll take you by the hand and we'll go together and we'll turn this around and get what it is that this profession needs and your futures will be very bright and that is the other side of the coin is that what a great future for pharmacy we're just lagging behind with the payment. And once we get that caught up, you guys will all be working Monday through Friday, nine to five in clinics. <laughs> and I feel we're so close to being there we are to, to really so close. Um, yeah. Just seeing that change in our profession. It's, it, I think it's going to make a huge impact. It's things that we can already do. We're already doing um, just really provides us the time more so to be able to help our patients. So Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Um, you know, thank you to the audience as well. You listening and supporting the show is absolutely huge. I think it helps promote pharmacy. Share it with other pharmacists so that they're aware as well. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, our podcast. Um, all of that really helps. So thank you to all of you and um, happy Thanksgiving, which is next week. And same to you, Kathy. Thank you so much, Carol.